This is a pod. A pod about dogs. Healthy dogs. It's the healthy dog pod. Thank you to the sponsor of this season of the Healthy Dog Pod, Field Day. Field Day is an Australian-made and owned dog health and wellness brand that creates products to help your dog live the best and healthiest life, inside and out. Field Day has a range of whole food meal toppers that target the top four health concerns for dogs. Joints, digestion, anxiety, and skin. They're also really easy to use. You simply add them to the food that your dog already loves. You can also look after your dog's skin and coat health with Field Day's brand new grooming range. Field Day also donates 1% of all online profits to Pets of the Homeless. This is a charity that works to help keep vulnerable people and their pets together by alleviating the burden of providing essential pet care during times of hardship. You can shop the Field Day range online now at fieldaypet.com.au and use the code HDP10 for 10% off site-wide. That's HDP10 for 10% off. Now it's time to get to the show. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the show. Today, we've got myself and Sophie, as always, and we're here with Tracy Irons from ABBS, Australian Veterinary Behaviour Services. Welcome to the show, Trace. Hey, guys. How you doing? Very good. good. Thank you. Good. And today, we're going to be talking about the difference between a training problem and a behaviour issue. We're going to be talking about what causes behaviour and how all of that affects our training methodology when we're working with a client. So Trace, first of all, just give us a bit of a brief background on yourself and you know why, why, why we're here today. Sure. So my name's Tracy Irons. I'm one of the co-directors of ABBS. Uh, we started ABBS in 2012. Uh, myself and my business partner, Dr. Tracy Henderson, she was one of the first uh, veterinary behaviorists, uh, first vet in South Australia with her memberships. Uh, in behavior and we just you know we loved behavior we just just couldn't get enough of it so the two of us decided to take the world on and uh, we developed ABBS so myself back my background personally is I worked at RSPCA for uh, about 11 years I worked as a kennel supervisor and a behavior trainer and that's where I developed my passion for behavior I got to see and work with numerous dogs with different levels of behavioral concerns, different training problems. And it was a great way to actually get my teeth into it and go, wow, this, you know, we can actually make a difference here. Um, When Trace and I started up, it was about actually applying what I knew from uh, RSPCA and going into homes where uh, it was great to actually work with owners that, wanted to actually help their dogs whereas working in a shelter environment where the answer to people's problems you know I have a problem with this dog I don't want it anymore this is now you know your problem to pass on to someone else so it's actually great to work with owners that want to do the right thing by their dogs and see a really really good outcome I also get to work with um, Greyhounds New South Wales. I get to go there and be part of their pet prep program. Uh, I was part of a a team that developed their first pet prep uh, park um, in uh, New South Wales, in country New South Wales. So this uh, park is really about helping these retired greyhounds learn different surfaces and different environments so we can get them ready for their new home. So these guys are exposed to stairs, um, ramps, bikes, wheelchairs, so many um, things that they'll encounter uh, once they go into a home. So that is probably um, something I'm really, really proud of at the moment, uh, working with these uh, retired dogs. They're just fabulous dogs to work with. Yeah, that's, I mean, from a personal standpoint, you know, we've known each other about five years now and we met in one of your workshops where we would you were talking well what were you talking about on the day it was by prevention yeah was it's it? about working safely and understanding dogs yeah I remember at that point I didn't even realize that I'd signed up what was predominantly a workshop for rangers uh council rangers and things like that um and it was uh it was just some, a topic that struck my interest and 
I'm pretty sure Tracy thought I was just a little upstart that was in there to cause trouble. Yeah, um, but... <laughs> I googled you. But... <laughs> But from that day, you know, I learned so much um, about so many different things that day, not just bite prevention, but I also just then have taken it upon myself to really try and get as much, use Tracy as much as possible and get as much information as possible over the years. I've even sent my uh, team down for training from uh, you and your wonderful team down there in Adelaide. Yeah, absolutely. So good to have you on. I can speak from personal experience, like how excited I am to ha- just tap into that yeah. pretty incredible mind of yours. And the pa- <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> it's getting older. It's not so wise anymore. I don't think. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go the other way. Yeah, I think so. Um, what I'd love to do is just open up the open up the box, the the, the can of worms as it is, and just let's let's identify what we consider the difference between a training problem and a behavior issue. Mm. So if you want to kick us off in that direction, Trace, this is going sure. to be great. Sure. And I think it's really important whether you're in the industry or you work in a vet clinic or you're simply a dog owner, I think it's a really important about identifying which problem you have actually have to deal with because we see so many generic answers um, that aren't really specific for a training problem and they're not really specific for a um, behavioural problem, which we also call a mental illness problem with dogs. They do suffer from it. So when we're looking at the behaviours, we've got to go, you know, is this normal behaviour or is this excessive? Is it irrational? Is it actually affecting the quality of the welfare of that dog, the emotional welfare? Now, when we're identifying a training problem, we look at, I guess, the lifestyle of the dog. We look at the interaction with the owner and we ask some simple questions and go, right, what is actually the problem that you're concerned with? And it could be something as simple as, you know, this dog is just walking on Pulling on lead, pulling on lead is an example that we, we get we come across. So when we start asking questions, we go, right, well, you know, how much work have you actually done you know, to train this dog to walk on lead nicely? Well, I've taken them around the block a couple of times and all it does is pull. Now I've given up. Okay. So we're looking at the dog and we're assessing, you know, where he's at and we're going, actually, he's a really lovely dog. He's actually quite willing to work with us. He he's looking for information. He's going, you know, what exactly do you want me to do? And we've got this owner that just didn't get a response in the first couple of goes. And now it's all just too hard. So if we explain to the owner, it takes time and we've got to keep practicing, practicing, practicing. And we get this dog that actually responds to it then we're probably dealing with a training problem. A great trainer can actually help with training problems. So if the behavior seems normal and the owner maybe has no idea to train a dog or has, hasn't put the time or the consistency into it, then we can probably say, identify this concern as a training problem. Refer them to a great trainer, you know, someone like yourselves or anyone else that's on your list of, of, of accredited trainers as well. Um, and we can get some really good results. But if we're addressing the problem and we we look at um, the lifestyle of the dog and we start speaking to the owner and and, um, asking questions like, um, say, for barking, barking is a complaint that um, most trainers are dealt with. Um, If we start asking, you know, the frequency of this behaviour, how how often is this barking occurring? And they're just going, it's happening all the time. Like this barking is happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All right, let's look at the lifestyle of the dog. You know, what are we actually doing to help this dog um, and address this behavior? I'm walking him 20 Ks a day. I'm providing environmental enrichment. I do classes. I do all this stuff and it's not reducing the uh, barking. Now we're sort of ticking a box where we go, I think this behavior is excessive. It's irrational. Uh, and it's detrimental to the quality of the life of this dog. This dog isn't seem to be having a really good time. So having the sort of in, that sort of information under our belt, we now need to start identifying that this dog has actually probably got a behavioral problem. And behavioral problems are generally motivated or the cause is either anxiety um, or some sort of emotion that's going on. These dogs aren't thinking rationally at all. We need to see a vet. 
we need, it is a medical condition. Uh, when we're identifying a behavioural problem, we have to accept the fact that, you know, a vet is a, a place to go. Now, in saying that, there's not all vets that are all behaviour savvy. Um, but if we can get them onto the path of a vet that has um, some um, interest in behaviour, some further qualifications in behaviour, then that's a really good start. Um, hopefully a vet will take it on board and say, look, I actually don't know enough. I'll refer you on, which, which is always beneficial. Um, but that is always the first place to go when I, when I can recognise a, a behaviour as a behaviour or mental illness and, and it's affecting the dog's quality of life, then I always advise people have a chat with your vet first. I think it's a really good um, place to start. Yeah, I think you've got to definitely, you know, um, take it to the vet and just get that health check and have yeah. a look pain affecting the behavior as well. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially if the behaviour happens suddenly. So if a, a dog snaps at, say, a child or someone and it's never done it before, yeah. we might be able to say, look, okay, is pain actually influencing that behaviour? Can we reduce the pain to reduce that behaviour? So there's, in, in my opinion, there's so many different, I guess, avenues that we can go down, but definitely a vet we can get a nice picture of what, what actually is going on. And if the vet can do a health check with that dog and go, look, pain is probably not causing this behaviour, you probably need to investigate a bit further and, and see the likes of a, a vet with an interest in behaviour. We can do so much harm if we end up pushing a training programme into onto a client and their dog if their dog is going through a behaviour issue, oh. a medical issue. Yeah. Um, if we if we overimpose and we end up pushing the dog into these situations like adamant that we can change behavior um, but the internal environment of that dog is off and he's in pain or he's feeling anxious we're gonna cause more bad than good we're going mm. we, we're going to see the dogs if they're in pain they're going to build negative associations to what they expose them to. Hmm. And what I'd love to dive into a little bit more, Trace, is the when that dog is anxious, like what frame of mind they're in, because they're not in the right frame of mind for learning, learning new skills and learning positive associations, are they? No, not at all. And I think a, a word that we really need to start using um, when we're addressing and identifying dogs with um, behavioural problems, so mental health concerns, is that they are suffering. And it, it's a term that we don't really associate with behavioural problems. We generally associate it when a dog is stuck on a chain with no anxiety, uh, with no freedom, uh, or it's in pain, it's suffering. But actually the mental internal um, emotions um, that these dogs have no control of and aren't getting any help for it, they too are suffering. And we overlook that as, you know, oh, no, no, they'll be fine, they'll be fine. But imagine being in that emotional turmoil. It, it, it wouldn't be pleasant to experience it either. I think, you know, to dive into that just quickly, like it's very hard for uh, people to accept that i think because hmm. it's like when we say like somebody will call us and go my dog is aggressive or my dog is fearful or they'll put this label on the dog hmm. and that doesn't mean that the dog is in fact it means the opposite your dog is not that 24 hours a day so when we say he's suffering we don't mean that he's suffering in some cases they are but like hmm. yeah necessarily mean that they're suffering 24 hours a day hmm. we mean hmm. in this context hmm. your dog is suffering emotionally and mm. then we look at the individual circumstances and to what degree because if that is something that your dog can't escape every single day mm. then i know that's really difficult to hear and yes he shows happy and con uh, behaviors in other contexts but your dog is quite literally suffering every day yeah and then we look at the welfare and the quality of life of our dogs mm. um, and that's that's where we do, and you taught me this, it was looking at the training, looking at the management and looking at the, the medical side of things. Mm. Those three things go hand in hand. Mm. And now I'm going to bring us back around to the 
dog when he's feeling anxious? You know, what, why isn't a dog that's feeling anxious? What I really want to get into is why isn't a dog that's feeling anxious ready for training? Well, because emotionally, it's just not able to retain any information at that present time. So, you know, if we think of it from, I guess, a human perspective, if, if we're seeking therapy, like cognitive therapy to um, overcome a fear or a phobia, we have to be, I guess, in a calm emotional state as well to see the trigger and go, okay, I think I'm okay. I think I, think I can handle this right now. But if this person's having a full-blown panic attack, then there's not going to be any, I guess, um, uh, ability to sort of work with their emotions going, can I fight this? Can I not fight this? And, and there'll be this internal struggle going, oh, my God, no, I can't do it, I can't do it, and just go over threshold. And, you know, we won't be able to, I guess, associate anything positively with that trigger and again when we're dealing with these dogs as well when we see and hear and as you said before we we stick this label on a dog saying the dog is dog aggressive the first thing that people want to do is take this dog and expose it to more dogs when the dog is actually saying i'm really scared of other dogs i don't like other dogs and we're so quick to expose them to their biggest fear and accept and expect them to tolerate um, and all of a sudden have this positive experience with them when their poor little brain, so their little amygdala, their little flight, fight response is just overriding and these guys cannot actually take in any new learning. So it's what we call fear learning and they're learning to avoid rather to embrace um, that trigger. It's Sorry, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think that's a really important point. Um, just to drive home to people about, you know, flooding your dog and being mm. like, if my dog doesn't like dogs, I'll take him to the dog park. Mm. That's, get over it. Mm. And that's just not the way to do it. It's going to have to be slow and steady. And, you know, those little steps to build them up to, you know, if you eventually want to get them to the dog park or, you know, it's got to be that little, those little steps. You can't just throw them in the deep end and expect them to swim. It's just not going to work like that. And you'll get a dog that shuts down. Mm. Mm -hmm. but also i think we also also have to accept is that there's some dogs that don't enjoy the company of other dogs and and that's okay mm -hmm. like it, it it's really okay that your dog doesn't enjoy the company of other dogs and when we get that information we have to work with it and go well actually no i have a dog that doesn't like other dogs so i have to avoid other dogs and that's okay because yeah. if it makes it better for your dog and that's what it should be about, not about your emotions and your experience and what you want to be completely different from, you know, I want my kids to be, you know, Olympic swimmers. Well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's just, it's not going to happen. They have no interest in swimming whatsoever. So it's not going to be, it's not going to happen. So, you know, you get a grief for, you know, it's not going to happen. So um, I've just got to be happy that, you know, my, my daughter loves dance and that's what she's into. And I have to sit through hours of recitals, which, you know, really isn't my cup of tea, but that's all right. That's what she enjoys. So, you know, it's the same. It's the same. I'm going to Sorry. include the graphic in the, uh, in the show notes. We've got this, we've got this graphic on, it's like a bell curve of yeah. what is normal in dogs and what is abnormal. And at one end of uh, the minimum is, uh, a really aggressive and reactive dogs mm. and at the other end of the a, a very low percentage as well is really social dogs mm. middle where most of the dogs are are dogs that are dog selective and mm. dogs that are just of dogs and yeah. you know just i don't mind dogs but they're not my best friends but the thing is the bias is so heavily towards normalizing the really overtly social dogs, because that's what people see. They're the dogs that get taken to the cafes. They're the ones that get taken to the dog park. So people see them all the time and they normalize them. The thing is, the vast majority of dogs aren't in that category. We just don't see them as much because people are actually just going, do you know what? Like, he doesn't like dogs. He's dog selected. I'm not gonna put him in, in a place where he's really, really, really surrounded by dogs. So it's uh, important to people one, understand that it's normal for dogs to be dog selective and dog tolerant. It's not 
it's not normal for them to be dog reactive and definitely to work with that. But like you said, Trace, it was definitely learning from you in the early days that put me on the path to actually making me really consider how does the dog feel about this? Because whether or not we can change the behavior is, or whether or not we should try to change the behavior was a question I started asking myself from that. Like, yeah, I could probably get this dog to conform and do really, really nice behaviors on a human level, but how does the dog feel about that? And if my dog is having a big emotional reaction, then I should listen to him. You know, he's really, really telling me how he feels about it. Mm. And I don't think, as the more I learned, those big reactions, they come down the track after he's tried telling me really subtly. Mm. So yeah. that then led down the path of studying body language and mm. looking at the really more subtle skills because I think, I don't think it's a secret on the podcast. Like it's certainly not, I don't but, I'm, it's not secret. I used to be an aversive trainer. I used to be very good at getting dogs shut down yeah. and make, making dogs comply to look like well-behaved and good oh. dogs. Oh. But it, it was it was that conversation within myself of going, I don't know, this doesn't feel right. I don't know if I should be doing this. Oh. My dogs. So the more I listen to my dog, um, and then and then it took confidence for me as a trainer over the years to have the confidence to say that to somebody else. Um, somebody's paid me to go into their house and change their dog behavior so it conforms in a way that they want it to and I used to sit there and make them very happy (laughs) And and these days I sit there and go I'm not sure we should be doing that and we go then we've got a different conversation on our hands and as trainers um we shouldn't just be people pleasers. And it and that has massively affected my training methodology over the years. Like how I how I train dogs has mm. evolved and is still evolving all of the time. There's not many days where I don't have, if not an internal conversation mm. uh, with myself as to how I should be training dogs. But mm. I've got a team, that's why we do these podcasts, it's because we're always learning and, I, and none of us know everything. Oh. Mm. Um. Ian, you know, sitting in on your consults and people like, so I'm going to take my dog to the dog park and I want it to be a cafe dog and I want to do this. And then when you get to that consult and you speak to them and you show them the body language and, you know, we start walking to the cafe and you're like, they're not enjoying this. Mm-hmm. And the person's like, oh, okay, I understand now why my dog can't be at that cafe yet or why my dog can't be at that dog park yet. Mm-hmm. And I think exactly what you said, I think that's so important to explain to people your dog's not enjoying this. We need mm. to work on this mm. to get to that point. Mm. Definitely and that when we're in the moment there, you know, we're, we're assessing that behavior all of the time. And what we're looking at is, is the dog, where is the dog's state of arousal? Because for me, that actually defines in the moment whether we're looking at a training problem or a behavior issue. Mm. Because if the dog's state of arousal is over threshold so we start seeing the dog uh out of context showing stress signals like heavy breathing uh hyper vigilance excessive attention seeking you know really really excessive behaviors what we're seeing is a dog who's like you said earlier trace the amygdala is fired Mm. no longer in a frame of mind where it's actually choosing its behavior it's just responding and reacting uh because it's it's in that state of arousal where it's Mm. no longer Mm. Mm. and we in that moment we're going to try to get its arousal down we're no longer trying to train the dog Mm. we're trying to make that dog we're trying to do whatever we can to get that dog state of arousal down so in the moment i might try soothing it i might try offering treats i might do something to make it feel better but ultimately very quickly i'll make a snap decision on going if this is working fantastic i'll carry on if not i actually just need to stop my training session and take the dog out of the situation or take the situation away from the dog Mm. because the dog is learning. I think it's really important to identify that the dog is learning in that context. He's just not learning anything you want him to. And he's actually practicing all the shit you don't want him to. And there's the first one. 
Yeah, and 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 I think and you're spot on. And what we teach a lot of our clients that come and see us, and and you've got to remember the clients that come and see us, we're we're at the crossroads for them. They're either going to euthanize, or they're going to actually seek um, behavioral medicine and uh, management and monitoring. So we see really high end anxiety, and and we see a lot of dogs that do some crazy stuff where you go, wow, that's an exceptionally amazing dog to live with. Like people can't leave the house because the dog will literally destroy the house. Uh, we have dogs that go through windows, jump off two-story balconies. We have dogs that are so aggressive to their triggers that they literally want to kill them, like literally. And, and it's so excessive and so irrational um, that these owners are just, you know, are throwing themselves at us going, but they have that bond with the dog. Um, it's not, it's not dis- diminished yet, that bond. It's still there. But what we actually have to help these owners understand is that they have to grieve for the dog. And it doesn't mean in the sense of euthanasia. It simply means going, this is what you wanted from the puppy. You, you had this wonderful um, dream that when you pick this puppy up, that you're going to do all this amazing stuff with it. You're going to go to the dog park. You're going to go to the beach. You're going to do all these amazing things with your dogs. And now you've got a dog with a behavioral problem. It's now very limited or you're not going to be able to do it. And so that grieving process has to happen where they have to take on board going, right, this is kind of what I signed up for, but this is what I've got. And I now have to change my life. If I want to keep this dog alive, that I have to change my life to accommodate this dog. And, you know, it is a grieving for them. And some of them can do really well and go, you know, when we say to some owners, you don't have to walk your dog. It's a big thing for them to let go. Going, well, to be a good dog owner, I have to walk my dog. That, that's what the, the rules are. If I put it on social media, I have to walk my dog 20 Ks a day. That, that is a definition of a good dog owner. But when your dog is reacting and not having a great time out there and the dog would rather be home doing stuff with the owner, some, you know, building the relationship there, it, it, it's that whole process of going, so I don't have to walk my dog. That's kind of good because I really hate it anyway. Like I just, I don't enjoy it. Um, and to take that pressure and that weight off the owner is, is great. But then they've got to go through that whole grieving process of going, oh, you know, it's, it's not kind of what I signed up for, but it's obviously the pathway I've got to go down. And um, for some, it's really easy. For some, it's really difficult for some owners. Yeah, I think society puts so much pressure on owners to be like, you need to walk your dog three times a day. You need to yeah. You just need to do that. And when I tell people, throw that out the window and do what's best for your dog and for yourself as well. Mm. Exactly what I said, if that's stressing you out, mm. you know, shorten the walk, make it easier, set little goals for yourself. Don't yeah. take half an hour, you know, take them for five minutes outside, make mm. it without them reacting. Yeah. I think it's really important for people to hear because they get stressed when people go, oh my God, I haven't walked my dog today. No. Or, Three walks today. No. They need oh, to start yeah. pairing their dog to other dogs' lives. That's a big way. It's the first step to actually not meeting your own dog's needs. No. Yeah. And, and in turn, your own. You know, the client, like you said, the dog owner is not enjoying this experience. No. Something... I've always said is we get dogs to make us and them happy. We're talking about pet dogs, right? These are dogs that we bring into our lives purely to make the family whole. Mm. And there's no rule book. Like if we actually strip it back, there is no rule book. There's little old ladies living with dogs that don't leave the house happy as a pig and shit. And Mm. there's living on a farm running around one day happy Mm. as a pig and shit. If we actually just take the needs of our dog into the situation and throw the others out, uh, we need to take ours in as well. And there's certain situations where the situ- circumstances are essential, but essential is essential. It's not want, it's different. There's, there's a difference there. And if we take social norm out of the essential equation, then we can start having people really live quite content lives with their dogs. And mm-hmm. 
then that again comes back down to like i said like that the training the management and the medical side of things like management is a huge huge factor you know Mm. it is part of training and we manage our own behavior and our own interactions so much to make sure that our behavior is what we would deem appropriate like i don't put myself myself in situations so like that all the time I'm avoiding situations so that my behavior is appropriate Mm. and management needs to be considered a very, very effective training tool for our trainers. We shouldn't always be trying to train new behavior. If we've got a dog, like we said, that first example that you pulled out the bag trace with the dog that's walking around on the leash has just hasn't had the right direction that Mm. he's needed. The client hasn't had, the right direction they needed absolutely train your dog but but something we should be asking ourselves as professionals and even as dog owners is not just whether we can change the behavior it's whether we should try yeah 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 and is the outcome going to benefit us or the dog Yeah. yeah yeah there's um you know that that those dogs that we see hyper aroused um they're not having a good time and and learning about body language i I encourage every single Mm. dog owner or trainer to go and study body language because that that's them speaking that's them telling us how they feel what's going on in their world and they're not lying (laughs) they're they're not faking it and so something But I guess also when you're referring to, you know, dog communication and um, their body language, it's it's also uh, if they're going to seek information is the up-to-date information on body language because my interpretation might be different from your interpretation, which may be different from someone else's interpretation. Might we see a lot of trainers going, he's doing really well, look at him, he's quiet and he's and he's accepting and he's submitted. Whereas you and I look at it and go, oh, he's shut down, he's withdrawn, um, this is not a dog having a great time. So again, it it's it's the information. The <coughs> sorry. <coughs> oh, bless me, sorry. Bless you. Dog hair, um, sorry. I think we could definitely help people with there on the spot right now with some red flags. You know, if uh, if we start, if you're watching videos on body language and it's getting described as, oh, okay, he's submitting or he's tolerating that, um, he's, uh, you know, we're, we're those sort of words, those two words for me are real mm. red flags. Mm. Tolerating it, that ain't good, right? You can tolerate a lot of things, mm. and I don't like any of them. Okay. Now, um, and submitting. Now, if we actually look at what submitting is, if we break that down, like waving that white flag is saying, I actually am just giving up. I don't want any more onslaught on me. Mm. That's a horrible head to be in. Mm. Yeah, you have a lot. And training methods that are asking dogs to tolerate and are asking dogs to submit are suppressing the dog's communication on how that, how that dog feels. Mm. Um, whereas when, our, when we're training a dog, the three of us have a really similar methodology and principles behind this. What we're trying to do is introduce the dog to stimulus, but using distance, using speed, using like the amount of distraction in its environment to our advantage to make sure that that dog remains in a calm state of mind, in a frame of mind where he's learning and our cues for that, my cues for that are absence of overt behavior and is he coherent? Mm. If he can hear me, if he can turn his head around and listen and respond, I know I've got a dog that's actually in the moment really comfortable. Mm. And it's mm. a really simple gauge you know i look at the body language and if it's if there's an absence of tension for all the little details in the world like the lip licking and the ears and the eyes they're fantastic and if you really know what you're looking at great go and use them mm. but if not for the layman body tension mm. right so there's two really useful things i think that the public can take away and go 
my dog's under threshold, he can hear me and he's showing an absence of tension. Mm. If he can't hear me and if he's showing tension, whether that's just focus on something that he, we deem that he loves, mm. right? He's still a dog who's overstimulated, over threshold and no longer in the best and optimal frame of mind for training. Yeah. That it takes time. It is slower than flooding the dog and throwing them in the deep end to see optimum results. But what are optimum results? You know, like that goes back to our ethics conversation around what is right for us necessary isn't necessarily right for the dog. So optimum results need to be that term needs to be evaluated as well. Mm. Uh, I mean, I always advise people to train dogs, not test dogs. People are so quick in testing dogs to see if they're going to be okay. And I always advise people that the best we might get is tolerance, just to tolerate. And, and because I deal with a lot of um, retired greyhounds and, and dogs that are older and, and you see um, there's a big increase of rescue dogs at the moment, um, that their quick response is, is they grab this dog and they they want to socialize these dogs i need to socialize this dog he's he's lived on the chain for all of his life and and i need him to be socialized well the socialization period happens between three to four to 12 to 14 weeks of age it's, it's done so now it's about habituation and that's what we really need to educate people on is that you you need to, you're actually habituating your dog to different environments and that's just simply getting used to and accepting yeah. and tolerating it's not about play and having a, a great time so again this is where all this information that's going out there that people are putting their emotional needs first and forgetting the information that the dog's giving us and going well I, I just have to do it. It, it, it is. And, and then we, we just got this never ending recycling of dogs because, you know, I, I, I did, I socialized him down the park and it just, it just went pear shape. So, you know, it's now done, it's over. And, and I think this is where we as, as professional people and um, we, we just need to get that information out to as many people as we can about the correct terms and actually what it means out there um because yeah it just it can do so much more harm than good which is really sad something i'd love to just dive into there you know i meant we, we've both actually in this conversation took tolerating differently which is and, I, and i'm leaning more towards uh what you've said than what i originally said you know um and something to identify to people again is what does tolerating look like mm. um, and a lot of it is and this again is the difference in methodology, training methodology. We, we are often trying to train the dog to do an alternative or try to do behaviors. Mm -hmm. Training methods that try to shut down behavior are the ones that we would, rec I think we're in agreement, would recommend avoiding. Mm -hmm. And when we're trying to train a dog to tolerate something and to, uh, to just, or even, in any context, we're trying to train the dog to do something else. And if we're looking at tolerating, if we can identify what that is, mm. a lot of it is acknowledging it yeah. and going, I'm going this way, yeah. right? Whether that is a, 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 a garbage truck that we don't like, whether that's another dog, whether that's whatever that stimulus is, mm. by going, yeah, it's there, I'm just, I don't need to lose my shit. No. I don't need it to be rainbows either. No. I've just got to accept that it's present and yeah. that's it. And that's, that's really where we need to educate people and going, just leave that as your benchmark. That's, yeah. that, that's where your benchmark should be. Just acceptance and tolerating the presence of it. And that's it. You know, like you were saying, Ian, we can present ourselves with all of our triggers, but we have the capabilities. You know, we might go to, um, you know, you and I have gone to uh, places where there's some people sprouting the stuff that they, they truly believe is the right stuff. And, and But you and I can tolerate it and go, yeah, look, okay, look, I, I accept that what he's saying and, and all that. I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to, you know, jump up and down. I don't need to cause a scene. I can just tolerate listening to him. But I'm going to just walk away from it because it's it's just not what I do. And and again, that's what we need to help people understand is, is sometimes a neutral emotion is actually okay. Like it doesn't, mm. do people need to push to get that, 
that joy response and their exuberant response or do they need to push to get the reactive response like what is nothing like nothing is great yeah exactly. <laughs> I love nothing I'm gonna be really really pedantic here because I not like you yeah, I know right <laughs> but I'm going to pick it apart a little nothing and walking away are two separate things mm. Okay, nothing, there is no nothing, right? We can't ask a dog to do nothing because that no. is still, and this is just me being pedantic, but this is the difference in the methodology again. Mm -hmm. A shutdown dog is doing what, what gets described as doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we're training and when I'm training, I protect what I call the exit route. Mm -hmm. And walking away is always an option for my dog. Mm -hmm. You can always leave. And mm. if he chooses to, he's going to get praised the shit out of mm. because good on you, mate. You didn't escalate the situation. Mm. And I know that I'm being pedantic, but I'm sitting there and my brain has the whole previously used to be a uh, correction based trainer. Mm. And I, I pick both sides of, I pick arguments apart like that. My, my, <laughs> and mm. I know that if we're not careful with that language, uh, people will still ask the dog to sit there and tolerate yeah. because he's not doing nothing. Mm, mm. He's doing, so yeah, it's a, for me, that's a pretty important factor. Mm, absolutely. Um, so by by yeah. not like Tracy, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you saying like looking at it and then kind of moving on? Is yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, so absolutely. No, no heightened response, no. Yeah no over the top no reactivity just yeah acceptance yeah I'm saying that I know okay. what Trish is saying i i'm just worried what the uh if somebody's watching the video if mm. they can identify the difference between the two by by, by looking at that detail mm. i think cuz something i'm trying to process right now is i know from my experience what tracy's saying but if I didn't have this experience, what would I really be looking at? And what would mm. I be taking? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Because I went to exactly what you said, Tracy. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. nothing. Yeah. yeah. And it does. It, it does come with experience and time and being able to. I mean, I can look at a dog and pretty work, much work out where we're at. And um, but that's years of, of doing this. Yeah. And um and it, it should never be a competition when working with dogs going, you know, I'm going to win. It's just, it's just, it's just not, but yeah. And sorry, going off track, but yeah, it, it does. It's something that takes time. But again, it, it, if we're going to help people uh, understand about um, body language and communication, we also got to put them on the right track about the right information out there for them, because there's a lot of misinterpretation of body language. Oh. Oh. <laughs> As we know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what we might do in our show notes is uh, include some some nice images and graphics and uh, in the notes so that people can actually have some nice references and uh, where to go so. for body. Mm. Yeah. That's really important because I think that's one thing that I always teach people is about body language, and they go, "Oh, yeah, they do it all the time." I didn't really know what that meant. Mm. Mm. So I think really important and I always say like once you see it you can't unsee it either Thank yeah you. you get you get new superpower goggles and all of a sudden you can't unsee it and that's what most particip participants who come to my workshops go oh my god like I look at my dog so differently now I thought he liked that but he doesn't like that anymore it's like yeah I know you get these superpowers so be very careful though when you use your superpowers you know, family, friends and, and all that really don't tolerate it. You know, I go driving with my kids and I'll look at someone walking their dog, uh, you know, on the street and my kids automatically turn to me and go, oh, so what's wrong with that, mum? I'm going, well, you know, this, this and this. So um, it just be very careful when you use your superpowers. <laughs> Something I've definitely learned over the years is don't give advice to people that haven't asked for it. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, just sit back and eat the popcorn and just go, I'm going to watch this go down. <laughs> well, guys, I might, uh, we might wrap up there. That was, um, that was so much fun. Um, I absolutely love catching up with you, Trace, every single time we do. It's, yeah. uh, it's always such a 
I always learn something. <laughs> um, so thank you so much uh, for, for coming on, Trace. Um, it's, like I say, it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, we'll speak to each other soon, I'm sure. Absolutely. The pleasure's always mine. Love it. Take care, guys. We hope you enjoyed this episode of The Healthy Dog Pod. We know we did. Thank you again to our sponsor, Field Day, for making this season of The Healthy Dog Pod possible. And remember, folks, a healthy dog's a happy dog. Woo! And that was the pod. The Healthy Dog Pod.